Well, good morning and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here. Let's stand together and let's worship together. God's people said, amen. Now would you take an opportunity to greet those around you. We're glad you're here today.
Thank you, children. And they were here in the first service. You know, time changed. They got up really early to be at church this morning. Not only did they sing that song for us, they illustrated it. That was their artwork up on the screen. And how powerful that was. Thank you, children, for sharing with us in this service this morning. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Kind of a rainy day out there, but what a wonderful week we've had as spring is now almost here. In many ways, it is here. And we're excited about what's going to be happening in the days to come. If you're our guest today, please take a moment and fill out a communication card. You'll find one in the pew rack. And uh, hold on to it, and then at the end of the service, drop it in the offering plate. Last Sunday, John Copeland was with us, former staff member here. In the early service, you didn't get to see him. But today, his wife Margaret Copeland is here. Margaret, where are you? Margaret, stand up, and Kara is somewhere in the house. Kara, if you'll stand up too. It's so good to see you again. And you're going to be here a few days, so maybe folks will get to see you. Wanda Dow, where's Wanda? I, Wanda, you stand up. I want you to look into the face of a living legend. <laughs> she, yeah. She has been selected one of Alexandria's living legends, and she'll be honored this Tuesday night down in Old Town, and we're proud to know her, proud she's part of our church, so you congratulate her before it's all over. Okay, let's pray together today. Father, it's good to be in your house. Thank you for each one who has come, for how we've been blessed already, and for all that is in store. Thank you for our guests who've come to share in with us, and those that are watching who can't be here at all. We pray that all of us receive a blessing today. And as we offer unto you worthy praise, speak to our hearts and draw us closer to yourself. Say something to each of us that will make a difference today and this week and even for eternity. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
when we worship in song here at First Baptist, you often see a scripture on the screen on the title page. And I hope that you read those scriptures. Let's read this one together. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. We're thankful for the blood of Christ, which washes away all of our sin. Would you stand? Let's continue to sing together.
You're wondering what the early crowd looked like this morning, the time change crowd. They were here. We had a good crowd in the first service and a wonderful time together. We're going to have a big crowd two weeks from today on Easter Sunday, and I need your help. We'll have twice as many people on Easter as we do on a typical Sunday. We're having three services, one at 8 o'clock, and then the usual ones at 9.30 and 11. You take your pick. Come to one of them. Bring somebody with you to one of them, but then volunteer to serve in one of the other two. And right after this service out in the FAC, I want to meet with you for about 12 minutes as soon as I can get there when we dismiss, if you'll join me, that we, we won't even have time to sit down. But I want to talk to you about how you can help make Easter a great day at First Baptist Church. There are five areas where we need volunteers. And we've already got volunteers in every one of the areas, but we need more. So come find out about it, then you can decide if you'd like to participate with us as a volunteer on that day. It has been a busy weekend at First Baptist Church. A lot of our men are gone today. They're on a men's retreat. They didn't sleep in. They've been retreating, and they'll be back later on. Our girls, many of them, had a slumber party on Friday night, and then yesterday, Audrey and I hosted 60 GA girls and their moms at our house for afternoon tea, and it was wonderful. And if you hear any of them, I've heard it already as I'm walking around, if you hear any of them call out to me, hey, Carson, that was my name yesterday. I was the butler. As I opened the door and welcomed them, they had permission to call me Carson yesterday. Two of our young adults got married yesterday down in Richmond, and many of you perhaps were there. But it was also a weekend for funerals. I participated in two funerals this weekend. And then there was another big one. We opened our doors for another church that needed a large space. There was a third funeral over the weekend. And then maybe you watched Nancy Reagan's funeral from Simi Valley, California. Elegant and beautiful and so very fitting. Funerals. At the funeral I did yesterday, there was a teenager, and I asked her, have you ever been to a funeral before? And she hadn't. They were younger children. They'd never been to one either. This was their first. But you've been to funerals. When you go to a funeral, what are you thinking about? What's going through your mind? I'm going to guess that when you are waiting for the funeral to begin, you are thinking about your own funeral one day. What's it going to be like? Who will be there? What's the preacher going to say? I can be bought if you're worried about that. I, we can make a, we make a little arrangement now. But really, what's the preacher going to say? I wonder, how will I be eulogized? Now, I've been attending funerals all my life, and I've been conducting them for over 40 years. Here's something I've learned. Who, here's who will be at your funeral. Your family, your closest friends, and your faith community. That's pretty much it. Your family your closest friends, and your faith community. Now, if that's true, let me tell you what you need to do. You need to be investing more of your time with those folks instead of everybody else. Invest your time with your family and your friends and your faith community. Thirty-five years ago, I was uh, called to be pastor of a church in Orlando, and their homecoming day is coming up, and they wrote, and they wrote everybody, I guess, and they were asking for memories, memories of those days. And so last night, Audrey and I sat down, and we were thinking about uh, those years long, long ago. I was a young preacher, dark hair and all of that. And I started thinking, and one of the memories that immediately came to mind, because it's never far away from my mind, was of an old gentleman named Ray. Ray Hardy. He joined our church while I was there, and he became something like a father figure to me. My father had uh, died, and so he kind of took that place. One day, he came to my office to pick me up. I thought we were going to lunch, but no. He was taking me to a men's clothing store. He said, Don, every preacher needs a black suit, and you don't have one. And one day, you're going to do my funeral, and I want you to wear a black suit. So he took me and we bought it, and he bought me a long-sleeved white dress shirt. 
He said another thing, Don, never wear a short sleeve shirt with a suit. Nobody had ever told me that. And I was doing it regularly. I've not done it since. <laughs> Got on a long sleeve shirt today. I did do Ray's funeral. And for the first and only time in my ministry, as I was conducting his service, I fell into tears. I just dissolved right in front of the folks. So grieving was my heart. Yeah, we think about things like that at funerals. I don't know what you think about, but I know what the Thessalonian Christians were thinking about when they went to their first funeral as a church. They're a young church. They, they just got started a few months ago. Paul had taught them many things, but then he was taken away. He had to get out of town because of persecution. He had taught them that Jesus was coming back any minute now. And uh, every Christian generation has believed that. Paul believed it. That's what he taught. He taught them just enough about the second coming to scare them, to frighten them. He didn't have time to tell them the whole story. So the Thessalonians are thinking, he's coming back any moment. We're all going to be caught up with him in the clouds. It's going to be great. And then grandma died. Or a teenager in the church died, or even a baby. And the church is thrown for a loop. Am I ever going to see my loved one again? Is grandma going to miss Jesus coming back? We were looking forward to that, and now... She's not going to see it happen. So Paul gets word about it, and he writes this letter. In every chapter, he mentions the second coming of Jesus, but never more fully than in chapter 4. Look at it with me. Chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed about those who fall asleep. Now, that's a euphemism for death. When you die, you don't fall asleep. Your loved one is not sleeping in the grave. But when you die, you look like you're sleeping. Your body is in repose. We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not go before those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. I'm talking about the second coming of Jesus today, and I don't want to scare you. I want to encourage you because of it. So the Thessalonian Christians are grieving, and they're at loose ends. Someone has died, and, and what's going to become of them? So Paul writes, and he gives them some words. The first word is a word of consolation or a word of comfort. What do you say to somebody when there's been a death? People ask me all the time, what do I say? I'm afraid to go to the visitation. I'm afraid to go by the house. I don't know what to say. Well, who does? It's difficult to know what to say. And, and let me give you some good news. You don't have to say anything. Just your presence makes all the difference in the world. Just be there. But I'll tell you what I tell them. People look to me and expect me to have some sort of answer. I say, it's all right to grieve. It's human. It's natural. Everybody grieves. We grieve differently. Adults from children, teenagers from older folk. Everybody grieves differently, but everybody grieves. Yesterday when I was conducting the service, I, I looked into the corners of the eyes of people sitting on the front couple of rows, and I saw tears. Everybody 
grieves. It's all right to grieve. Just don't grieve as those who have no hope. We have hope today in Christ Jesus. Theocritus said, hopes are for the living. The dead are without hope. And you've heard people say, while there's life, there's hope. That's not a Christian expression. Because we believe even after life, even when death comes, there's still hope. And our hope is in Christ. For since we believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, the events we're going to be talking about these next two weeks, because we believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, also those of us who trust in Christ, though we die, we shall rise to live forevermore. That's our Christian hope. Now, when we talk about hope, oftentimes, you know, we'll say, well, I hope I'll get a raise, or I hope I get the promotion. I hope she'll say yes. I hope I'll uh, pass my grade. I hope I'll get into the university. And when we say that, that means we don't know for sure. We're hoping, but we can't count on it. That's not the way I'm using the word. Christian hope is absolutely certain. It's coming. So Paul gives them that word of comfort. And then he gives them a word of assurance. A word of assurance. They're worried that grandma is not going to participate in the second coming of Jesus, that she has missed out because she died. Paul writes to say, look, she's not going to miss a thing. In fact, she's going to have a better place than you do. Her vantage point in heaven is better than the one you're going to have. She's going to be a part of it all. A couple of years ago, Audrey and I went to Siena, Italy, and we were there for the Palio. That's the famous centuries-old race around the trapezoidal-shaped uh, city square, and the various parts of the city come together, and they've got their horse, and they've got their rider, and they race around three times around that track. Well, we happened to be there, and we were there hours early, and we asked in the restaurant where we had lunch, we said, where's the best place to stand? And our waiter said, well, I'll tell you, and he pointed out the place, and we got there hours ahead of time, and we stood, and the crowds got larger and larger, thousands and thousands of people, and we discovered we were standing at the starting line of the race, and then we realized we were also standing at the finish line of the race. Now, how's that for a vantage point? We got to see them take off. We got to see them arrive. We were there to see the winner. Well, that's grandma. That's those who've gone before you. That's your loved one in heaven right now. They're not going to miss a thing. We're not going to precede them. Now, when your loved one died as a Christian, she was laid in a grave, or maybe there was cremation, or maybe they were lost at sea, or whatever. They were laid to rest. But the real person, the real person closed his eyes in life here and opened them in the presence of Jesus. Your loved one is with Christ right now, has been for years talking and walking with him. And the saints of the ages, they're there. But one day when Christ returns, he's going to bring them with him. The graves are going to open. The bodies will be reconstituted, will be snatched up, and in midair remade so that we have new bodies, new physical, spiritual bodies, the Scripture says. And then those of us still alive on the earth are caught up. We join them and are there forever. That's the word of assurance that the apostle wants us to have. So he comforts us. He assures us. And here's the last thing. He tells us about the great reunion that is coming. There's a great reunion. Do you go to reunions? Does your family have them? Folks you haven't seen in a long time, maybe, maybe it's been several years. Or your high school reunion. I mean, you went back for the 10th, and you decided I'm never going to do that again, but now it's time for your 40th, and you're going to give it one more shot and see if they've grown up and how things have changed and who's more successful than you are and all, all the rest. You know, reunions. 
We love to get back together again. Paul writes about one that is coming. Because you see, the comfort he gives and the assurance he gives is not wishful thinking. It's not mere sentimentality. He's not just saying, hope for the best. He's giving them a sure word. Look at what he says. Verse 15, according to the Lord's own word. Now, the problem here is we don't have a direct quote from Jesus saying the things that Paul says. But uh, Jesus did talk much about his second coming. Matthew 24, Luke 12, other places. He said he'd come as a thief in the night. He would come suddenly when least expected and all of that. He did talk about it. Maybe this is a special word of revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Verse 16. The Lord himself shall descend with a shout. The Lord himself. Now underline that. Who's coming back? Who's coming back at the end of the age? He's not going to send an angel. He's not going to send a surrogate. It's not going to be St. Peter who comes to get you. It's going to be Jesus himself. Remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus ascended? He had risen from the grave, then several days later ascended to to the Father, and the disciples are standing there on the hillside, and and they're waving goodbye, and they're weeping because now he really is gone. And uh, angels appeared in the sky and said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that you see going into heaven shall so come again in like manner, just as you've seen him go. Uh, That crowd that day, they had seen Jesus bodily before his death, after his resurrection. You've seen neither. We've seen pictures, but I mean, who knows how accurate they are. But one day we will see the Lord. In fact, Revelation chapter 1 says, every eye will see him. Those who pierced him shall wail because of him. Paul said in Philippians, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What's he tell us? How does he encourage and comfort these people? Well, he tells them four things about this second coming. He says it's imminent, it is powerful, it is glorious, and it is permanent. First of all, it's imminent. That means it could happen at any minute. Now, Christians have always believed that. That's what the Thessalonians were believing. That's why they're confused. They didn't think anybody was going to die. It was going to be so soon. It was hearing a message like this 50 years ago when I was a young teenager that I gave my life to Christ. I was sure he was coming back. The preacher made it so vivid and so real. And that was a half century ago, and he still hasn't come. Does that mean he's not? No. It means his coming is closer now than it was then. His coming is imminent. And evidently, the Apostle Paul is so sure he's coming back soon He thought he might be in the group that was still alive on the earth. Because when he talks about what happens to the deceased, he says, and then those of us that are still living, those of us who are still living shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He thought he was going to still be alive. He was wrong. In fact, this is the first thing he writes in our New Testament. The last thing he writes is 2 Timothy. And by the time he comes to that passage of Scripture, he says, the time of my death is at hand. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Yeah, he was wrong. And those who believed that Jesus was coming before they died and they died, they were wrong. But they were not wrong to believe it because Christ is coming back imminently at any moment and it's going to be powerful when he comes powerful there'll be a shout the the voice of the archangel and then the trumpet blast of God it won't be quiet it'll be big now I know the Bible says he comes as a thief in the night that means he's coming suddenly without warning but when he comes it will be known what a great day that is A powerful, powerful moment. 
We were several hours waiting for the paleo to begin in Siena, and while we were waiting, we couldn't sit down because the crowd was all pressed in so tightly together. And about uh, 10 or 15 minutes before the race was to begin, this huge cannon blast was heard, and it was deafening because we were standing right beside it. I hadn't even noticed it. But it just blasted this huge... Have you ever been next to a cannon when it exploded? All I could think about, it had just been a few weeks or a few months uh, since the Boston Marathon shooting, and I thought that's what was going on in this crowd of thousands. I couldn't hear anything. And about the time my hearing returned, they did it again. <laughs> this time, I, I don't want to move because I got the best seat in the house. One more time, a third time, the cannon blasted. Why? Because this was a big deal was calling everybody to attention. I just happened to be closest to it. This is going to be a powerful, powerful moment. And it's going to be glorious because Jesus will be in the, in the, in the clouds. Heavens will open. Jesus will descend. The same Jesus who walked the earth was crucified, dead, buried, risen. The same Jesus. The graves will open and the bodies of the the Christians who've gone before, they are resurrected and they ascend. And then those of us, I'm still, I'm, I'm going to be in that group, I still think. Maybe not, but I, I'd like to be. We'll hear that shout, we'll hear that trumpet blast, and we'll be caught up too for his glorious appearing. That's what it's referred to in the Bible, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And uh, one more thing. It is a permanent reunion because the, the dead are risen, the Christians who are alive are caught up, we meet the Lord in the air, and thus the Scripture says we shall, we shall always be with the Lord. Wherever Jesus is for the rest of eternity, we'll be right there with him. And not just Jesus, but our loved ones. The Thessalonians were worried they'd never see their loved ones again. The comfort we have today is, yes, we will. We will spend eternity together. Eternity. Last year, I uh, rotated off the board of trustees for uh, the John Leland Center. Been on their board for years, but my time was up. They gave me a beautiful clock that is now in my office. And two or three weeks ago, I finished up my service on the board of trustees for Guidestone, and they gave me a watch, and I, I'm wearing it right now. My son was home last week, and I was telling him about it, and he said, Dad, do you, do you know why they always give you time pieces? when you rotate off something or, you know, you've worked for, you know, Coca-Cola for 50 years, you know why they give you the proverbial gold watch? And I didn't. I'd never thought about it. He said, when they give you that timepiece, they're telling you, look, you gave your time to us, now we're giving time back to you. Time. Well, there'll be a day when time will be no more. The God who has always been, always will be, we will, we will move from time into eternity as his gift to us who believe. And there'll never be a time when it's over. Don't you want to be a part of that? Doesn't everybody want to be a part of that? I'm calling you today to put your faith and trust in Christ. If you never have before, I want you to do it today. You can do it right where you're sitting. Just bow your head and ask Christ to come into your life. Tell him you believe and tell him you're turning away from the old life and you're embracing the new and you want him to be your Lord. You need to do it. In a moment, we're going to sing, and if you want to do it, I want you to come forward and let me know. Let me pray with you about it. Confirm it in your heart. Maybe you've done this recently and nobody knows it. You need to let folks know. Or you've got some other kind of spiritual need. You want somebody to pray for you. You step out and come to the front and we'll pray for you too. Father, thank you for your word today. 
May it give comfort and assurance and challenge to our hearts. And now for those who need to respond, I pray you would move in their lives. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we say. so much. Please be seated. Good morning. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God loves a cheerful giver. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the Bible, says, God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. Let's pray together. God of grace, it is our delight and our devotion to give these gifts to you. All we are and all we have are yours alone. Accept this joyful offering as a token of our abiding love. Use it to bring peace, justice, and comfort to all the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <laughs> Thank you. 